And now, Acts 4.33 Church brings the gospel to you through words of grace with your guide, the Reverend Dr. Matthew Webster. A new series begins right now. I want to welcome everyone who's tuning in, joining us. This new series is entitled The God-Led Path. Today we're going to look at the land of the unknown, the place where we must head forward by faith, putting our trust in God. And we're going to look at the story of Abram, and we're going to see what enabled Abram to put his trust in God as God actually led him forth to a place that he would show him later. He had to first take those, those steps forward by faith. Um, the first verse we're going to go ahead and put up on your screen for you comes from Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Many people mistakenly think that this is the first time that God actually spoke to Abram. It's not the case. Uh, it, it's the first time that it's recorded of the words that God spoke to Abram. But if you go back to the New Testament, you'll find in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, that this is not the case. God actually spoke to Abram before uh, this point. We'll get there in a minute. But I wanted to look at um, the many times in our lives where God will, will give us a, the next steps in our lives. And, and the puzzle piece that we have, we look at it and we go, this is so strange. This doesn't make any sense at all. I wish God would just show me uh, the puzzle picture of my life. It would be so much easier if I had an overall picture of everything that, that I was supposed to go into. But I can tell you that if you had more than one piece if you had many pieces that were dumped on your lap, you'd become overwhelmed. You would become uh, just uh, perplexed as to how does this fit with this piece. And so Jesus would say something uh, to us. And he would say something that's very helpful for me in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. He said, Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. I get an amen there. Each day has so much in it just in itself. And if I had to worry about tomorrow and the day after, the week after, the months after, the years after, I would just get so stressed out. I think I'd be immobilized and I wouldn't even be able to take a, the next step forward. So God's so loving. He's like, here's what I want you to focus on today. Would you trust me? Today, don't worry about your tomorrow. I'm going to take care of it for you. I'm going to show you how this piece fits in with that piece. And I can tell you, we get some strange puzzle pieces. Abram got a very strange piece. God said, go to the land I will show you. I'm not going to tell you the name. I'm not going to put it on the map for you. Trust me, I'm going to want you to take some steps forward to the land that I will show you. If you look at that puzzle piece, that looks pretty strange. So I mentioned that in chapter 12, verse 1, the verse that I just put up on the screens, that's not the first time that God spoke to Abram. In fact, when we go to Acts chapter 7 uh, in the New Testament, it actually revealed in verses 2 through 4 that God spoke to him previously saying the same thing. Uh, and so I'm going to put that up. For us to follow. In verse 2, it says, To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. God would later uh, change his name from Abram to Abraham. Same guy. While he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Now, Haran. Now, see, this is so important. Because when we come to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the place that Abraham is currently at is Haran. So the writer in Acts, uh, Luke, would say God spoke to him before he even lived here in Haran. In Genesis 12, 1, he's in Haran already. In Genesis chapter 11, verses 31 through 32, when you back it up, just a few verses in the previous chapter, you see this. Terak, that's Abram's father, uh, it says, Terak took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, 
and his daughter-in-law, Sarah, the wife of his son, Abram. And together they sent out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Tarak lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. See, God had already spoke to Abram. And he told Abram to move to a place. But first, before he would move to that place that God was calling him forth, he first settled in Haran. Haran means dried up, parched. And what that speaks to me and what that speaks to you in your life is this. That God's calling on our life is not to inhabit or to live in the dried up, parched place of Haran. It doesn't mean that we're not going to experience places that are dried up and parched. And we might have to spend a little bit of time settling there. It might be a stop in your journey. But God is not calling you to Haran. He's leading you to the lowland or the green pastures. That's what Canaan means. Psalm 23 speaks to this. I love this. It's so beautiful. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Where is God leading you in your life? He's leading you to Canaan, the lowland, the place of still waters, the green pastures. What about Psalm 23, 4? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Wow. <laughs> A simple truth about the valley of the shadow of death is this. In order for there to be a shadow, there must be a light. And did you know that the light in our life is Jesus, the great light of the world? And Jesus walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. His light is by our side and it testifies that we are not alone. I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. And this place that David wrote about, it's not metaphorical. This is a real place. You can visit it today. I want to put it up on the screen for you to see it. It's that valley that cuts right through there. Uh... It's in the Greek is where we get the word Gehenna. It's Gehenum is, is the place you see here. David knew that as it being a shepherd and moving sheep forward, that he would have to take them through this valley of the shadow of death where predators and enemies hung out looking to devour his sheep. But as long as the shepherd is with his sheep, they're going to be all right. He's going to get them through there because they, if they get through that place, they will arrive at the green pastures and they will be able to feed. In the dark, dangerous places, God, our good shepherd, goes with us. And he leads us personally in order to feed us. And what's the very next thing that the Psalm 23 says? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why do you got to worry about what the next step is? The good shepherd is the one leading you. And even in the dangerous places, he prepares a feast for us. In the presence of our enemies, not in the absence of our enemies. The valley of the shadow of death testifies that his light is with us. He goes with us on these journeys. And He is the one who directs our steps. Trust God. Trust God. <clears throat> Abram's earthly father, Tarak, had died. I can tell you that death can be disorienting. Death in itself can make you want to camp out and inhabit the place of grief with your loved ones. But this is not God's calling for Abram to hang out and to camp out in the parched land, in a land of grief, in a land of suffering. And what this tells me is that if you put your trust in your heavenly Father and you step out into the place God will lead you to, you will find movement from a dried up parched place of death to a new place that is full of life. That's what Genesis 11 and Genesis chapter 12 tells us. 
It's where we place our faith. We will find life because that is the place that God is leading us forward, forward into. When we get to Genesis chapter 12, the reason I wanted to say that this isn't the first time that God spoke to Abram is because uh, in that, in that, he confirms that this is in fact what I want you to do. And in this part, in Genesis 12, God will actually add another puzzle piece to Abram's story. You see, he knew he needed to go to the, the land that he would show him. But God has something amazing that he wants to say to him. He wants to speak to him. And that's in verses 2 and 3. He says that he's going to make him a great nation. I'm not just going to lead you into a place so you struggle, so that you, you have to really work hard just to make ends meet. I'm going to lead you to a place where I'm going to do something great in your life. I'm going to bless you. You see, this is where God is leading us forward in our lives in Christ Jesus, is a place of blessing where he can show his favor is on our lives. And the great thing about this is I think we miss the point when we look at the story of Genesis 12. Many times we think it's about Abram's faith. We say he's the father of faith. Look at how amazing his faith is. This story is not about Abram's faith. This story is about the faithfulness of God. Because you'll see that Abram's faith is not perfect. In this same chapter, he doubts God. He doesn't even, he forgets what God says to him, or he doesn't believe it's going to happen, or he thinks that maybe i got to help God out. We're going to see that in a moment. So this isn't about Abram's faith, but what God's word will bring forth in your life. If you will trust it, if you will believe in it, he says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I'm going to make your name great and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. Did you notice that God did not put a condition on this? <laughs> I love it. You and I might screw up, and we will screw up. Abram screwed up. But in Christ, living in the new covenant, our salvation is secure, and we are blessed as we take these steps forward by faith. And even if we doubt, and even if we screw up, we are still on course for the promised land. Do you know that the Abrahamic covenant is still in it's still in effect today? Blessings for all people to be found in Jesus because this is speaking to the messianic lineage. The child that God gave through Abram and his barren wife Sarah, the promised child Isaac. So what was it? What was it that enabled Abram to head out into the unknown place. Because i got to tell you, there are times that God is going to call you to take steps of faith. To trust Him, to not understand, but to move forward. And what it was that enabled Abram to head out into this unknown place is, was the word of the Lord. It was the word of the Lord that initiated the faith of Abram. Because the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by the hearing of the Word of God. You see, it's important for you to tune in uh, when we bring forth these messages, because it's not my opinions. I'm bringing forth the very Word of God, and, and, and the goal here is to initiate your faith as you hear these words, that you would take steps in your life in faith, trusting God that He is the Good Shepherd. How am I ever going to get through this? How is this peace going to fit with this piece. You see, sometimes we, it takes the next piece for it to make sense. But no matter what, it's all about trusting God. It's all about trusting Him. Have you ever felt like you needed more faith? Have you ever felt like, if I only had more faith, then maybe I could b believe in this miracle taking place in my life, the thing that I desire. Maybe if I had a little bit more faith, I'll see a breakthrough in my health. Maybe if I had a little more faith, I would see a breakthrough in my finances. Maybe I could trust God 
and, and, and give and be generous like he's calling me to do. If I had a little bit more faith. I've got good news for you. I've got great news, in fact. Faith is not a struggle. We might struggle in some areas, but faith is not a struggle. The scripture tells us about hearing, the hearing uh, the, of the word of God and how faith is initiated by that. And it also talks about the works of the law. And they are total opposites, faith and the law. If you see Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 5, you'll see this. And since works of the law come by self-effort, there is no self-effort in faith. What is there in faith? There's one thing in faith. It's trust. Go back to the 23rd Psalm. What is our part? Our part is simply trusting the Good Shepherd. He's the one that's guiding us. He's the one leading us. He's the one preparing the feast for us. He's the one protecting us. All you got to do is trust Him. You see, faith and the law are opposite. The more people become self-conscious, the more they look at their self-efforts to receive from the Lord, the more faith is depleted from them. We'll see this happens with Abram. God knew what Abram needed was to receive a word from him to initiate his faith in order to move him forward. The more we see Jesus, the more conscious we are that he has been crucified on our behalf. <clears throat> faith will no longer be a barrier to receive God's promises. Why is that? Why, how did, why does it work that way? Because the more that we see what Jesus has done for us, the more we see what Jesus has qualified us for, and the more that faith will spring up within us to see miracles break forth. You don't have to wish for more faith for whatever miracle that you're asking for or believing in. You don't have to try to conjure up more faith. You simply need to see Jesus on the cross for you and the faith that you need to face any situation, any circumstance, will come into your life. I promise you that. Just look to Jesus and His grace toward you. In fact, the Bible says He is the author and the finisher of our faith. The more of Jesus that we see, and uh, we, that Jesus and His love that you hear, the more the faith will rise in your heart. Whatever your challenge is today, Continue to listen to the gospel of Jesus and it will always bring more faith and it will always bring more peace. That was our last series. And it will always lead you forward to the green pastures and the good success that God is bringing forth into your life. So Abram went, it says in verse 4. He went as the Lord told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. Man, I hope that's the commentary of my life. I hope that at age 75, if God has me on this planet that long, that I'm ready to take steps forward by faith, saying this is a grand adventure, and I'm not too old to see God do some amazing things. You see, some of the most amazing things happen in Abram's life at 75 years of age and older. So don't stop thinking that I'm too old to see God do some amazing things in my life if I'm in the twilight years of my life. I believe every day as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this adventure is going to become even more grand. And we're going to have more people probably to experience it with as far as in our, as our family grows, like our kids and grandkids and, and, and things like that, just to see them and to be able to have helped them grow in their faith and, and, and for us to be, you know, uh, just, just uh, entrusted to bring God's word into their lives. So he's 75 years when he set out from Haran. He seems to be, be easy to say, I'm 75 and I should just stay here. This is not where God's calling you. He's calling you forward by faith. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they'd accumulated and the people they'd acquired in Haran set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Traveled from, through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh and Shechem. 
At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give you this land. I want to show you the land. There it is. I, I actually drew numbers. Helps me out. We can see where he was, where he was first at, in the first number one. That's the place that God spoke to Abraham. And number two, that's the place he dwelt where his father died. Number three uh, is him moving and seeing the beautiful land that God would show him. In number four, he's on the very edge of the promised land. And then number five, he actually moves outside of God's promised land for him. The Lord had revealed where he was to dwell. He confirmed his promises again and again and again. And I wish that the commentary right now was that he went in by faith and he possessed the land that God said was his. Instead, it says he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, there's nothing wrong at this point. He's in the promised land and he wants to build an altar there to remember that God appeared to him, that God had promised him something. And you know it's great in your life to construct something, a reminder of God's faithfulness to you, of God's word to you. A journal it. Uh, make a note of it. Put it before you so you continue when things happen that just are puzzling to go, no, this is what God showed me. This is what God spoke to me. This is what I believe God is doing in my life. There's nothing wrong with that. That is awesome. But it says in verse 8, He went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and he called on the name of the Lord. Still nothing wrong. He's calling on God. He's communicating with God. He's making sure this is what God has for him. God, do you have any new instructions for him? He's checking in. He's in the land and he's praising God. Of course, when you're in the land, the promised land, you are going to praise God because you're going to see the blessings all around you. Verse 9, Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Verse 10 says there was a famine in the, in the land. So what does Abram do? <laughs> How about go back to the famineless land that God promised you, Abram? Instead, what he does is he goes further away from the promise. It says, Abram went down to Egypt. You see Egypt on the map all the way away from the promise to live there for a while because the famine was so severe. I can tell you this word says he, Necca, he removed himself from the promised land. And when he removed himself from God's promise, that is where he started to encounter a famine. When he moved away from what God had promised to him. Really? God led you to Canaan. And you removed yourself from this land. And you went to the world to provide for you. It's Egypt. What a faithless move. But no matter how bad Abram screws up, God will remain faithful to his promise, to his word. We see no matter how bad we screw up, the promises that God has made to us in Christ remain true. And those promises should instill confidence in your life. He went to Egypt, a place where no child of God belongs. The Egyptians are like the Canaanites. They're descendants of Ham. They were polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. They were cruel and they were immoral. They re he resorted to Egypt, to the uh, world. And it's typical of the tendency when we've substituted the loss of spiritual power to go to the fleshly resources of the world. And I know this was a faithless choice because we will see the heart of Abram revealed in the very next moments. I told you this is not about the faith of Abram. This is about the faithfulness of God. And when he says something in his word, he will deliver it. You've got to trust that. You've got to believe in that. As he went about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, Sarai or Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Well, that's a good word to say to your wife. <laughs> I know what a beautiful woman you are. You should have stopped right there. Any more that you're going to add to that, you're going to get yourself in trouble. 
Verse 12, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but they will let you live. What? Did you just read that? Did you hear that? They will kill me. God promised you in Genesis 12, verse 2, I will make you a great nation. So let me ask you, Abram, how many kids do you have at this point? You have zero. You have zero. How are you going to be a great nation if they're going to kill you and you've got no offspring? You see, then he was faithless in the moment. He says, if I don't devise a plan and if I don't help God out here, then I'm going to not get the promise that God has made. Are you kidding me? If God said it, he will bring it about. He says, say you are my sister. He says to Sarah, say you're my sister. Quick, get on Facebook and change your status account. Don't have me listed as your husband. Say I'm your brother. And she does it. She goes along with it. So that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Maybe he thought because Sarah is barren. Maybe he had to give her up. And maybe this was a part of God's plan. And maybe I'll get another wife and then I'll be able to have a child. Through You can see the wheels turning right here. Because later, when they're still barren, she says, Hey, maybe you should get with your, your, uh, your maid. Maybe that's how God will work this out. They still didn't learn the lesson completely here. So the wheels are turning. We've got to help God out here. Didn't God promise to make you a great nation? You think that God's promises only happen through your lies and your deception and your planning? You see, a lot of times we think that God needs our help. God doesn't need our help. We need God's help. And we are so blessed that God would choose to use us for his glory and for our good. May we trust that. May we see that. In Abram's faithless moments, God reveals he is still faithful. He does. It says in verse 14, when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was very beautiful. She's a beautiful woman. So, <laughs> Abram was telling the truth. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But remember, do you remember what God said? If you curse Abram and, and his people, you're going to be cursed. And even if it's indirect, you're taking his wife. And so look what happens. The Lord inflicted serious disease on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summons Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Do you see God giving Pharaoh wisdom to see that this blame does not go on God? This blame goes on Abram for his deception and his faithless moment. And the reason God would work through Pharaoh and speak this before Abram is so that Abram might once again be brought back to what God's word said. Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why didn't you say that she's my sister? So I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her. Go, please. Get out of here. Things were going good before you showed up. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and they sent him away with his wife and everything he had. You see, the promise was you'd be blessed. You screwed up, but I, I brought back my word to initiate faith, and I'm still going to bless you. I'm still going to lead you forward to the land I promised you. And you're going to get to go on this journey. I've equipped you with a lot. And in God's actions and words from Pharaoh, Abram has been reminded that God is going to deliver what he said in your life even though you screwed up and you messed up royally. In the faithfulness of God, it's the faithfulness of God that moves Abram forward, out from Haran, out from Egypt, back to the Promised Land. So Abram went from Egypt to Negev. He's finally going back to where he should have been with his wife, everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram 
became very wealthy in livestock and in silver and in gold. Now, I don't have time to go through all Abram or Abraham's life. But I want to close out with a small portion of what the writer of Hebrews commented about his life. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 11, it says, By faith, by faith, it's just trusting God. That's what faith is. By faith, Abraham, when called to a place, to go to a place, he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going. And I would like to add the commentary, even though he didn't do it perfectly, even though his faith was faithless at times. That was our story today, that God was faithful even when Abram was faithless, and God protected him perfectly. What will give you faith to journey to the place that God is leading you forth in your life is hearing those words that God has promised. Because in it, you will find a good shepherd always with us, always offering us his protection, showing us his love, his provision for us in Christ, and how even in the midst of various enemies in dangerous times, he's preparing a feast before us in the presence of our enemies, in the most unlikely place, in the most unlikely time. And that's why 2020 has been wild, and it has been dangerous, and it has been, it's just been a wild ride. But I can see God in it preparing a feast for his people. Trust him. Know that he is guiding you to the green pastures. He's guiding us to a place of refreshment and his rest. Let us pray and praise him for what he has done for us in, in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the story that it shows that even though Abram, Abraham is considered the father of faith, he was faithless many times. But through it, it gives me such confidence because you remain true to your word. In Christ, your favor is upon our lives. You are leading us to a place of blessing. And what we need to take those steps forward is not to have this puzzle piece or that puzzle piece figured out and try to smash them together or try to get involved and to help you, on, uh, help you out on, on the plans unfolding in our lives. What we need to do is simply to trust and to rest that what you have said to us, you will deliver. Lord, I thank you that on the grandest stage, in the, in the presence of the greatest enemies, your power is on display. And it is, shows how good you are and how, how it has really nothing to do with our ability other than just being in that place of trust. Lord, I thank you that all we have to focus on is today. Just today. May we communicate with you. May we... Uh, stop and listen to what you would speak to us right now. Because you're always, you're always guiding us. You're always speaking to us. We just need to quiet our soul and just receive from you. And to know that the place that you are leading is always to the green pastures, even though it goes through valleys of shadows of death. I thank you that you're not calling us to live in the land of the dried, parched up places. You may have us settle there temporarily to prepare us to move forward. But ultimately, our calling is the land of Canaan, the lowlands, the green lands, the beautiful lands that you would have your people to be. We thank you and we, we praise you for the precious promises that you have made to us that you will deliver through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.